So what have people been seeing? I've started seeing the first fledglings around. We have some Eastern Bluebird fledglings. Um, they just fledged actually today. And we have a mama song sparrow. Um, well, we were pulling some invasives. And then, so there's a nest in there and she has about four um, young and they just hatched yesterday. And so like they're all headed and they're bold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, they're really cute. And we saw a bobolink recently, a male singing on Kid Lane by the pond. A and, male, I assume. Yeah, and there's I... a great crested flycatcher nesting in a snag. Oh, nice, nice. I was out this morning and saw um, a red tailed hawk nest and the uh, the young were just these little white fluff balls and you can trying to like stick their head up above the nest and <laughs> it was really cute. I had to see some upland sandpipers today. So I was pretty excited uh, to get to see some of those. It was fun. Nice. I haven't, I didn't see them last week up there, so it's good. It was raining, so we didn't really have much surveying to do. <laughs> Where did you see the upland? Uh, over in the Fort Drum area. What state? Uh, New in York. The... Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to share anything that they've been seeing lately? Just lots of um, uh, young house finches and sparrows. Um, I think there were like four young house finches just mobbing like one parent. I felt a little, <laughs> I felt a little bad. <laughs> <laughs> we have that with starlings in our backyard. Like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> They're so noisy. <laughs> I Take was on me. I was hoping to find a brown thrasher nest in the in the area where I had seen um, two adults, one carrying probably nesting material. As I spent quiet time down there, all of these blackbirds, you know, all kinds of all kinds of noise up in the trees, and there came a red-tailed hawk, flew through, came back with a blackbird. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah, but not a thrasher baby. That's good. <laughs> good. Well, I think we can um, we can get started. Um, I just have a really short presentation today. I think. Um, a lot of people know roughly what a distraction display is, but I thought I would um, just talk about some of the, the variations and um, some of the other species that, that do distraction displays that people may not be aware of. Um, so I will just share my screen. Killdeer. <laughs> Killdeer. That's the classic one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Killdeer is the one that, like, like, probably the first example of distraction displays that most birders learn about. Um, so I, that's what we'll, we'll start there. Um, before we get there, actually, I just wanted to talk really briefly about um, uh, defensive mechanisms in general. Um, so birds have, you know, a lots of different types of behaviors. They have antagonistic behaviors, they have, you know, courtship behaviors, they have um, just behaviors that they use for raising young, um, but they also have a, a lot of defensive behaviors. Um, and their strategies can vary basically the same thing as us, like, fight, flight, freeze, um, 
So some of the ones that they use are hiding, crouching down, or freezing so that they are not seen by predators. Um, sometimes they'll just flee the area. Um, some of them will give these alarm calls and let the predators know that they've been seen, and then they know that they're much less likely to be able to actually catch a prey item. Um, and some of them use a whole variety of threat displays in, in order to intimidate other birds or predators. Um, and those can are usually are things that make them look bigger and more impressive and scary to smaller, um, sorry, to other um, potential predators. Um, some birds are very um, aggressive and brave, <laughs> I would say, and they um, will actually go and fight or mob predators. Um, it's a pretty, pretty dangerous um, approach, but um, you know, we're, I think most of us are familiar with things like um, here we have a, a mockingbird that's attacking um, a fish crow, uh, but we often see red-winged blackbirds and eastern kingbirds. Those are some of our really, really aggressive species that that tend to um, tend to mob other other larger birds that are potential nest predators. Um, and then in this category is where we would also find these distraction displays. So distraction displays can be defined as some sort of behavior that will make the, the adult seem more conspicuous. So it's like more obvious to the predator um, and it makes them look like a more appealing prey item. Um, and by doing that, they distract the predator's attention away from their nest or young birds, and they, they get all the attention on themselves. And that helps allow the, the young birds or the nest to go undiscovered or gives the young birds time to, um, to hide and, and get out of the way. Um, and then they, the, the adults are putting themselves at greater risk, um, but a lot of times they, um, they're, they're smart enough and they are aware enough of their surroundings and what's happening to be able to know when they actually have to fly and, and get out of the way so that they aren't actually captured by those predators. So killdeer are the most, um, probably the most famous species that we have that, that tend to give these distraction displays and they give them very readily. Um, so we, we end up seeing it quite a bit. Um, this, they, they do what's called a, a broken wing uh, display. So they'll pretend that their wing is broken. They'll kind of flop around with one wing up and their tail spread out and they're squawking and they're like, ah, help me, help me. I'm like dying and um, don't you want to come eat me, right? Um, so here's um, a nice display of pictures. This is not actually a killdeer. This is some sort of plover. Um, but you can see kind of all the different various postures that they make while they're trying to like look like they're injured and, and a good prey item. Um, so these are some of the types of displays that you'll see. So you'll see down on this list, I have injury feigning. That's kind of the very classic one. Um, and that's probably most likely what we'll be observing when we're out in the field and, and actually atlasing. That's the most common one that we'll see. Um, but there are some other ones where, you know, they might stand still and then they're like bobbing their tail or their head or something and making it look like, oh, I, it's like something's broken. And you like, here I am over here, like, don't you wanna come eat me and not my young? Um, sometimes they'll crouch down and do like a rodent run. Like I think of this as um, a lot of sparrows will do this and they'll just like scurry through the vegetation. And it's almost like a, like it looks like a shrew or a mole or something running through the vegetation. And so that will like take 
you know, raptors or foxes or something like that, um, that'll get their attention and they'll like go after that instead of going for the nest. Um, sometimes they'll fly and they'll um, kind of fly around in circles and not be in a very direct flight. And they're just kind of looking like they are injured, like they can't fly very well, um, you know, like a, like a young bird or an old injured bird. Um, so sometimes they'll do that. We have the, the injury feigning, and then there's also displacement. Um, so I was doing a little bit of reading up on this before we met tonight. Um, and I was kind of surprised at how many, <laughs> how many species actually do this displacement thing. Um, and the, it takes various forms where they, they'll pretend that they're brooding somewhere else. Like they'll, you know, their young might be over here, but they're going to pretend that they're brooding somewhere else on the beach or somewhere else in the water, right? Um, or they might pretend that they're feeding something, but they're actually not feeding their young. They're just like pretending and feeding like into the vegetation, something like this. They'll pretend to be asleep when they're not really asleep. Um, and then the coolest one is nest betrayal. So this like uh, least terns will do this where you know they their young might be at one location in the the turn colony and what they'll do is they see a predator coming they'll go over to another bird's nest and say hey don't you want these ch these chicks over here wouldn't they be tastier than mine right <laughs> And mm -hmm. they can do that with also like with gulls or like other species. It doesn't have to be like another turn, um, but that's what is called nest betrayal. So that is pretty cool. If you're watching turns or gulls, like keep an eye out. I think that would be really cool. I will say that a lot of the, the research on these distraction displays, um, there, there actually hasn't been a lot of research. So there's still a lot of unknowns. So um, some of your observations may be maybe new and, and worth, um, worth sharing and documenting. Um, so there's a number of different things that influence how often and how intense their distraction displays will be. Um, and that primarily depends on two things, how vulnerable their young might be or their nest and how valuable those young are to those birds. So, it's like how much have the parents invested in them? You know, if they are a species that readily breeds again, will have another brood, then they may not be as invested in that first batch of young as a species that only, only has one nest. And if it fails, then they're done until the following year. Um, so that's kind of what that valuable means. Um, so based on kind of those two factors, so vulnerable would be like, you know, if it's um, like right before the eggs hatch, their, their eggs are very vulnerable um, and very valuable to the adults because they're almost hatched. Um, and, and then the nestlings, um, as they become, get a little bit older. Um, Sorry, I'm just muting a couple people here. Okay. Um, as we as they get older, they become more self-sufficient. So when you have young fledglings, that's when the adults are very, very protective of their young. So the distraction displays, so this these factors um help to indicate which species of birds actually have distraction displays. Um, so birds that breed at higher latitudes, birds that breed in more open habitats where they have more exposed nests. So that's why we often think of a lot of the shorebirds have distraction displays. Species with precocial young, so young that, you know, as soon as they hatch, they're they're walking around and running around and, and they need to be, um, parents need to like keep an eye out for them and protect them. Um, things that have a single brood, so they don't have a chance to, to have more young again. 
until the following year. Um, those that have really short incubation periods and those that are often predated on by, by daytime ground, ground predators, ground-based predators. So those are some of the um, some of the factors that will influence like which species actually uh, perform these destruction displays. Because again, it is costly for them. The adults are putting themselves at more risk, and um, they, you know they don't want to do it unless they have to, right? <clears throat> um, so I found for I found a recent paper from twenty twenty two that looked at um, just broken wing display behavior. So that um, like what the killdeer do. Um, and there are 285 species that are documented, of bird species that are documented to perform the broken wing display. And that's from 52 different families. So, um, and that's worldwide. So that does cover most of um, many, many different families. Um, the most common ones that we have here are, again, those shorebirds. So you're thinking killdeer, um, some of the um, other plovers and terns, and also woodcock. Don't forget about woodcock. They tend to do really funky sounds and stuff and scurry around and make a little big racket. Um, grouse, the same thing. Things like, like rough grouse, I've seen... You know, we often, we all know about like when you're hiking on a trail and a rough grouse like flushes in front of you. But if the if there's a female and she has young, she's going to stay on the ground. She's going to stay on the trail. She might try to attack you. She'll be running around. She'll be squealing. She'll have parts of her feathers like sticking up. And um, it's like this crazy, really, uh, for me, I thought it, the first time I saw it, um, I, I thought it was like an injured dog that was like squealing around on the ground next to me. Uh, but it was really just like a rough grouse that was like, here I am. And all of her babies are like scurrying off into the woods. Uh, night jars um, do the same thing. So common night hawk, whippoorwill, chuckles widow. And then and then some of this, a few of the sparrows, and then a lot of our warblers do this. Um, so the one that I um, often tell people about are, you know, common yellow throats and oven birds will do this very readily. You know, if you're in some place and there's a really agitated oven bird or common yellow throat, if you go, if you just pish really quickly, like psh, 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 um, sometimes they just like flip right into a distraction display, like super quickly. And you're like, okay, you have young, like nearby, either a nest where they're about to fledge, or you have like young fledglings somewhere right nearby. Um, and so there's a lot of our warblers will do this. And, and they are, they're be in the bushes sometimes, they'll be on the ground, they'll be on branches and they're like fluttering around and like making lots of calls. And, you know, it, they like look like their, their wings are broken. Um, so yeah, so like the blue wing, golden wing, black throated blue, um, I think worm eating, oven bird, yellow throat, yellow warbler, yellow rumped warbler. Um, so a lot of our warblers actually will do these um, distraction displays. So it's something I think a lot of people don't really realize. They really just think of like rough grouse and killdeer doing it, but, um, but we have a, a bunch of other species that will, will do this as well. And then just one last quick slide. Um, so the, a lot of birds, you know, like I said, it's, it's something, it's kind of like a last resort uh, behavior that they'll, they'll do um, when they feel threatened. Um, they won't do it if, if the predator or threat is too close and they can't really get far enough away to be able to distract you. Um, or if they think that you're just gonna walk right on by, then they, they won't do it then either. Um, but it is really important. So if you do notice these behaviors and they're because of you, 
um, which I, I mean, how many yellow throats, I swear, they do this all the time. Like at this one stage, right when they're young hatch or right when their young are about to fledge, I feel like the two times that they get really intense and they will, like the males will like follow you as you're walking by and they will do these displays. Um, so if you notice that they're doing that, that, that means that they do have young there and they're feeling very threatened and you should really try to, to move on as quickly as you can. Um, back off, hide yourself, move out of the area, go somewhere else. Um, so we wanna minimize any disturbance to those birds. Um, so, so yeah, so that's all I have for tonight, um, but I'm happy to answer more questions about distraction displays or anything else related to the Atlas. I love hearing about what people are seeing and um, yeah, so technical issues, whatever types of questions people might have. And I'll stop sharing. Oops. Try to stop sharing. Is my screen still shared? Yeah, it is, right? But there's no. Yeah, it is still shared. Yep. I don't know why I can't <laughs> uh, stop like, sharing. Nothing. Yeah, there's like no pop ups anywhere. I can't. Ah, here it is on my other screen. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mary Beth, you have a cat hat. <laughs> Every time. I, I just. <laughs> I either have to lock him in the bathroom or just <laughs> this is what he does. <laughs> so this morning I did find a rose-breasted gross beak on a nest, which was great. So I just wanted to ask real quick, is it necessary? Do you want a photographs of that kind of thing? Or is that not necessary? Not necessary. No. No, no. It's not necessary. And if you want to, it's great. You know, there's a lot of yeah. species I mean, it's that kind of common. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of species where we don't have really good photos of like nests or like the really young fledglings. Um, yeah. I think rose crested grosbeak is probably is yeah. decently documented, not mm -hmm. great, but decent. I do have a question. How do you find an eastern wood peewee nest? <laughs> Good okay. I mean, I, because I'm like, how am I going? How can I confirm you? You know, I have had. I I feel like I've only ever like lucked upon a nest. Every time I have searched for one of their nests, yeah, I can never find them. The best we had one uh, here in Queens the year before the Atlas started. Like <laughs> there are a few things we had the year before. Yeah, uh, the way to get peewee is uh, fledglings. Exactly. And oh, uh, that's what I mean to say. around yeah. here, we've had them mostly in early September. You know, when you kind of have given up on atlasing and you're focusing on migrating warblers and things, which early mm -hmm. September is a good time. Yeah, that's kind of when they've been found around here. And you can yeah. see they, they look, you know, a little bit disheveled and they don't move around quite as much. And then you usually end up seeing, you know, multiple birds in the same area. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. Because I have yeah. two spots Wait for and the young ones. always there. So I'll just have to keep tabs on that. And <laughs> yep, exactly. Maybe I'll catch them with the young. Yeah. Yep. Just, yeah, and they do, like Steve said, they have multiple broods and, and they hang out a long time, late into the, late into the summer, early fall with young. Okay. So, yeah. I, this is Glenn Chapman. I found um, maybe four peewee nests. And in general, they're all like 20 or 30 feet high. And they're usually out away from the trunk at a fork in the branch. 
Okay. That's helpful. I will. All right. I've had them in I very, said that, I mean, I've had them in hardwood and softwood. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Julie, um, if we get up to uh, the combination of the probable and confirmed around 40 species coded, should we move on to a different block, even though we've only got maybe three hours? <laughs> um, I would try to, if you only have like three hours, I would put a little bit more in. Yeah, I, I, I would be really hesitant to mark anything down to less than 10. Yeah, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do all the blocks then if we spend more time at them. Rather, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking we should just, you know, shoot for the blocks that, you know, people aren't doing and try and get, you know, as many uh, coded species as we can and not put in the hours. Yes, I mean, I... I, I I hear you for sure. And and definitely like I know that you like you specifically have are very experienced and can do a block in less than 20. Um, but I do feel like spending, you know, at at least having at least a few different multiple visits of at least an hour each, um, like at different times of the season will increase our chances of seeing some of the less common species, um, which we are concerned about <laughs> as well. So for this year, I would still say, like, try to get it to the 45 probable or confirmed and at like 10 hours, yeah, for, for people that are experienced allosers. Is there any plan to close off some of the blocks, uh, you know, when they get to that point? Uh, or are you going to mm -hmm. wait to the end of the breeding season? No, I'm I'm kind of doing it continually. Um, uh, um, if you have blocks near you, um, are you like mostly Washington County area? Is that where you're well, talking there, you about? Know, or just all there's over? There's one block up near Speculator, you know, which it looks like it's overdone, but it hasn't been closed off yet. Okay. Yeah, shoot me an email and I'll I'll take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it just it kind of depends. Like the regional coordinators do a first review, and then and then and Jared and then I'll take a second look. And if we all agree that it should be marked complete, then we'll mark it complete. Um, but you know, people are on different timelines, and so some blocks have been overlooked so far. So yeah. yeah, so just ping me with like the name of the block and I'll yeah, I finally, check it out. I finally went to a priority block, you know, for the first time that didn't have a road or didn't have a trail. It's a little scary, but I made it back. <laughs> <laughs> did you bushwhack? Oh yeah. In like yeah. backpack, did you stay overnight? No, or just I, I, just, I just did a day, you know, I was yeah. only going to be out there a couple hours and not staying overnight. Nice. Wow. Awesome. Good for you. We just had our, um, we have four technicians this summer. Two of them just started on Monday and we just finished training and they just drove up to the Adirondacks today. So hopefully you'll start, everyone will start seeing a little bit more effort happening in the Adirondacks soon. <laughs> Yeah, they, they look funny with their, you know, head nets. <laughs> fly fly season is peak right now. Yep. I know yeah. they have head nets, so. <laughs> we have two more starting next week, too, so. Uh, going back to the question about uh, photos of nests, uh, if we have photos of nests, should we just post them uh, on eBird on the species page? So just a photo of you know whatever uh, whatever nest does, goes on the on the page for that species, or is there a different place yeah. for nest? No, it would go on your your eBird checklist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
And I try as much as I can for most of my talks and, you know, materials and everything that I put <clears throat> together to use photos from the New York Atlas. Um, but sometimes I, I can't because like, like, like today, like tonight's talk, I couldn't really because, well, one, it's just really hard to search for distraction displays. Um, but two, there's just very, very few photos of these behaviors um, other than like for killed deer. Um, it, it's like for any of the warblers, it's it's pretty rare to find a photo of them doing their display. So there's still a lot of, um, yeah, like I, yeah, like I said before, like also like with juveniles and stuff, we don't have many photos from New York. So um, photos are always great. And sound recordings too. I think there's, you know, we talked a little bit last week or two weeks ago about um, birding by ear. And I mentioned that a lot of the, the juveniles have very distinct calls that they give as well. Um, and a lot of those aren't really well documented. So both sound and um, photo are great. Dan. Uh, just wondering if anyone's finding palm warbler. Um, that's another one that does a nice little distraction display. So if mm -hmm. if you are around one, it's, it's good to look up for that. Are they being found? Or I know they're kind of. They are in some yeah. places. Yeah. Right. I mean, where people have been atlasing, like in that lowlands boreal habitat, mm -hmm. um, they've been finding palms and lincolns and um some of those species but um yeah i'm hoping that we'll get a bit more observations of those with the the technicians being out More questions, observations, technical difficulties, <laughs> anything? Hey, Julie, uh, Speed Music here. A uh, quick question for you. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned the fledgling calls. Is there a place where you can get a list of those or a list of ones that are good? I've discovered some of them on my own, like Baltimore Oriole. Oh, um, I don't know that one. Okay. Yeah, it's well. That's just in iBird has a was well, a juvenile call. Um, but okay. I don't, I don't know where to get other ones. Yeah, um, I don't either. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, some of them I've like learned over the years. Um, and you know, I think there's a few of them are documented, like on like Merlin. And sure. you can sometimes find them in Macaulay Library. Um, you know, I haven't actually searched using Xenocanto for juvenile calls, but I, I've been told mm, yeah. there are some there. Gotcha. There are. There are, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I have a copy of, and I don't, I don't know if they sell this, but it's called the Cornell master sounds so it's basically like you know like how merlin has the and all about birds have these um very um very good examples of sounds for for every species um this is basically the same but it is in more detail and there'll be like two or three times as many recordings and it will have like it will tell you what the behavior is, what the sound is, and also what the like where it was recorded, like what state or province. Um, mm -hmm. So that is something that I use as well. I'm not sure if that's I, I got it like directly from from Chris. Um, let me see from the eBird folks.
Well, that's that's useful anyway. I I I didn't know if there was some list somewhere, but uh, it's probably the kind of thing you just have to kind of hear something and then try and figure out what it is, kind of thing. I've I've done a number of uh, juvenile recordings, and I usually mark them as juvenile. So on Macaulay Library, one of the filters is for like mm -hmm. male, female, but juvenile is another one in those filters. So you can. So you can actually filter for it. You can filter. For you can. Now. I can show you that in just a sec here. So here's a link to what I was saying: the Cornell Guide to Bird Sounds. That's that's their their master sound library, which is really good. And then I can show you then the Macaulay. Um, let me just pull that up first before I share my screen. So. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so when you go to the Macaulay Library website, um, you first, you, you type in any species and then you'll get this list. So you can, you can filter by photo, um, sound or video. So for our purposes, we can go to the sound filter there. Um, and then under more filters, um, you can do by age, by sex, different behaviors, different kinds of sound, um, that kind of stuff. So Incredible do, cataloging. Yeah, so we can do juvenile. And then we can also, so there are some, yeah, like these are, that's what I showed last week or two weeks ago. Um, I gave like a screenshot and example of this rose beak young sound. So you can also go into contributor um, as well. Like if you know, like you want to um, you remove rose vest or rose beak. And so we can look and we can pull up all of Glenn's sound recordings that are for juveniles. So you can actually um, do it that way as well. If you want to go to a certain person. So this is what I use a lot to try to find the photos that people are uploading. Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll filter it by New York State. I'll filter the date to starting at 2020. Um, and then I will select some sort of breeding behavior. And that's how I'm trying to <clears throat> find the photos that people are, are listing. So when you do upload um, photo, sound, video, whatever, um, you use the media tags if you, if you can. Um, there are some, when you do that, there are some boxes that you can check that will um, makes it much easier to search. Oh. Any more questions? I have one, Julie. Yeah. Um, we came across a, a sapsucker tree that had yellow-bellied sapsucker um, noisily kind of defending it and around it and drinking the sap. From, it was a striped maple. And um, there was a, a scarlet tanager that came and was in the tree right next to it and was singing... Um, like a whisper song for a long time, maybe like 15 minutes or so. It, it didn't actually go to the tree, um, but I was wondering um, if, if scarlet tanagers would use a, the sap or the insects um, from a, a sapsucker tree. And also it had a female that, it, that was there, the male, the female came over. Um, so I was, I was trying to figure out if, if there was anything that's special that I could use for coding this behavior, 
or it just happened to be just circumstance? I don't actually know. Um, does anyone else know if tangers drink sap? Nobody knows. Or, or I know they eat insects. Um, so yeah. I don't know if they would be getting the insects from, you know, that are drawn to the sticky mapley sap. Yeah, that, that could be. Dan? You... Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. I, it's like mm -hmm. a feeding station. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I see insects come in and then uh, like ruby-throated hummingbirds will come in. And I, I think see. they probably eat both the insects and the sap. Yeah, I think it's really likely that some of these and some of these birds that eat insects here eat like fruit and sweet things to when they're in, you know, South America. Tanagers like particularly. That, you know? Yeah. I think it's yeah, that's a good observation or anything. Interesting. I would think this if it was just recently, Melinda, that you saw this. Um, I think it was about 10 days ago. Oh. Hmm. Um, yeah, or I was going to say if it was really recent, ago. maybe a week ago. Okay. Yeah. And the female tanagers like just showed up. Right. So I'm just thinking whether or not they would have had time to develop a pair bond or if the male was on territory or if they were still moving through. Um, because it, it sounds like probably you could do it as a pair, I would think at least for the tanagers. We, I did it for care. We also yeah. can, like, we want to try to get back to that spot again. Um, and so we could check and see if there seems to be a pair of tanagers right around that spot. Um, mm -hmm. Again, um, they could have been just flying through because it was early on when we had, you know, it was near our first few days of seeing them. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. But I did even so just to that see the behavior, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. What kind of birds are they talking about? Hillbilly step sucker. Mm. <clears throat> and a scarlet tanger. Yeah. I'm I'm uh I'm Google I'm looking on birds of the world. Did I'm... you see Arabella found? Yep, go ahead, Arabella. Oh, you found it, Arabella. Go ahead. Um, so oh, yeah, scarlet yeah. tanagers, they actually will drink sap, um, according to the Audubon website. The Audubon website says that. Okay, great. Interesting. Yeah. I, and I'm not, I'm actually not really seeing it in the, um, oh, it says possibly nectar, nectar on birds of the world. Um, but that's a, that's a really great point, Arabella. I really, I really do recommend, strongly recommend downloading, if you have space on your smartphone, downloading um, the Audubon app. Um, it's free. And it has a lot of information about habitat and diet and also some behaviors, breeding behaviors as well. Um, so it's just kind of a nice reference to have available in the field. Um, and it has different information than you get through, through eBird and Merlin and all about birds and all that stuff. So the Audubon app is, is good. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I have one question. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, I have about a, more than a dozen hummingbirds coming to my three hummingbird feeders. And uh, and I've only found one nest ever. And I'm wondering if anybody else has had luck finding hummingbird nests. They're difficult. That is one that people often ask me about. I the Most of the ones I've found have been kind of by luck, by chance. But I, I mean... So my so I have this strategy with um, sapsuckers where 
I will follow them literally from like tree to tree to tree because they're following, you know, their, their route and they just keep doing their route over and over and over again. So I just kind of wait for them to keep coming through. And I've tried that with hummingbirds and it doesn't work very well because they go out of sight really quickly. Um, so like that, that's the only like kind of strategy that I've tried with them and it has not really worked. So the one nest I found was about 30 yards from a feeder and it was right above a picnic table above a patio, 18 feet off the ground. And I don't know what the normal height is, but I've been trying to follow the, you know, I've had at least a half a dozen females coming to the feeders uh, and uh, wow. it's so hard to follow. <laughs> and I don't think they go very far because uh, they're here all the time. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. come back every 20 minutes or so or less. And they're always three or four of the feeders. Wow. So more than, you know, a dozen hummingbirds here. So I don't nice. know. Nice. Keep looking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Does anyone else have tips for hummingbirds? I feel like actually the ones I found have often been like at the edge of a park, kind of like you're describing, like above a picnic table or like just, I just, yeah, you just kind of happen. I happen upon them. But Just good luck from my standpoint. We did have one with nesting material this past weekend. Nice. That's good. I have found one that's away from people in a uh, wildlife management area. It was in a tree like 30 feet high. So it was, I happened to have a thermal camera and happened to find the bright spot and up there high up in the tree. So I can't imagine how I would wow. find that on mm -hmm. my own otherwise. Yeah, wow, I'm surprised. I'm even surprised, impressed that you picked it up with the thermal camera. That's great. <laughs> yeah, the thermal camera only works on overcast days because once there's sunlight, mm -hmm. then everything is hot and you can't see anything. But if it's been overcast, then things are relatively cool and any warm spot will show up better. Mm. Yeah. And I, I've even, Larry, I have even asked... I think Jared actually it was a friend of yours I asked about hummingbirds who had studied hummingbirds and I was like asked him I was like how do I how do I find hummingbird nests and he was like I have no idea <laughs> like he was like no it's, it's really hard <laughs> yeah I was shown one once at Course Crew Swamp Sanctuary that was 60 feet up in a cypress wow that somebody had somehow found <laughs> seeing them carry cattail fluff uh, that's as we close were, as I've uh, come. <laughs> we we were loading my son's car in Del Mar uh, last year to go on a you know, vacation, and the you know the back hatch went up, and I looked up, you know, and there was a hummingbird flew out, and it, it was in his only uh, sugar maple tree in the front yard, and it was about you know I would say nine feet above the ground. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a tricky one, Larry. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess they can't be too far away, so keep looking on the edge of the wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read somewhere that they nest in the vicinity of the raptors' nests because the raptors are have no interest in a hummingbird, so they use the safety <laughs> of the raptor as a defense mechanism for them. So you got a hawk nest around, look around for a hummingbird nest in the same vicinity. Well, I've got a broadwing nest nearby. I'll check that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> are they already on the broad the broadwings? Are they already on the nest? I feel uh, like I'm I still seeing a lot moving moving through. Yeah, I I think they're laying eggs now. The ones up oh, here. Yeah. Great. I have a female on a nest in my woods. Okay. I'm past them. Yep. Yeah. I had a chip that decided carrying nesting material yesterday. So they're starting to nest. And a hermit thrush is on eggs. I saw all that yesterday. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, things are happening. Yep. <laughs> Julie? Yes. Oh, um, I'm not too tech savvy, but I think I 
guess uh, you can hear me. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I wanted to report a sighting that was very unique about, I don't know, maybe it was five days ago. Uh, we were at Lido Beach, with, which is south of uh, it's the southern part of Long Island, South Shore. And we saw a great egret carrying a long stick. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I reported it to Brendan and he said that we're not far from a block, like a corner of our block is within um, the major block that they've been seen nesting. So that was quite an unusual um, find to see one carrying a really long stick. Nice. It was very, very <laughs> nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you like, they carry sticks that are like longer than they are. And you're just like, how are you doing that? <laughs> this was for yeah. sure. Yeah, it was really cool. So. Very cool. Very cool. Mm Anybody else? Questions or comments or requests or anything? I did have something odd happen the other day. We were at uh, Sands Point Preserve in Port Washington and observed a female red winged blackbird that um, along the edge of the pond where there's sort of a cement, uh, some sort of hard surface like that. It was leaning over the edge toward the water and pecking at the hard, um, you know, surface of whatever. It was, and it was spreading its tail as if maybe to help with supporting its balance or yeah. balance, right? But it was very unusual and it, it, it went a long way along the edge of the pond. So I surmised it was, I don't know, eating something or do you know anything about that? I would guess that there were probably either spiders or insects um, in right the in little the crevices and like, yeah, like in the little pebbly area there. So oh, that would that be my guess. Sense. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So like when we when we're going out, we're seeing a lot of bird species, but not a lot nesting. Like the boblin, he was in suitable habitat. Well, we actually heard another one responding. Um and then like there was a common grackle. Well, we heard the babies, they were all yelling when the adult went into a pine tree. And then we saw the adult um take some fecal matter out and drop him in the middle of the road. But mm -hmm. other than that, like not a lot. So do you have any tips? Yeah, I mean, part of it, a large part of it is just that it is early in the season and a lot of the birds just got here and they just aren't quite at that stage yet. So um, in a couple weeks, I would say, yeah, first two weeks of June, it should start to pick up um, and you should start to see more happening. Um, you know, some of the some of the migrants like just arrived and I haven't I haven't seen any female bobolinks yet, at least around here in Albany. Um, so, you know, I think the males are still like setting up territories, but um, the females haven't really started you know building their nests yet um so yeah i think it, it's right now just be patient a little bit longer mm -hmm. um and yeah hopefully it will just kind of increase for you okay thank you that makes sense like yeah some birds carrying nesting material like at the harlem valley rail trail there was a female that was first grass beak and she had a twig in her beak Oh, nice. So you were, you are seeing lots. It sounds like you were seeing a lot. Yeah, the dot, um, okay, like the, the kid lane. Um, but at Peach Hill Park a few weeks ago, or 
Well, on May 9th, I think it was, um, we had a female East Indian, and she grabbed a pine needle, like, cocked her head, and then dropped it, then grabbed it, and, like, she did this like, two more times. Then um, she just like, stuffed her beak full of pine needles and twigs, and then she kept cocking her head. It was really cute. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing, Arabella, is to look at, um, focus more right now, focus more on our, the resident birds, and particularly the cavity nesting birds. So like a lot of our, the woodpeckers that spend the winter here, um, chickadees, titmice, um, things like that, not hatches. Um, those get started earlier. And so some of those have young already. Um, and whereas a lot of the migrants just arrived and they would either be carrying nesting or maybe not even at that stage yet. Um, so yeah, so if you focus on those like birds that you see all year round, get a little more help. Okay, well, um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it is just about eight o'clock and um, I think we'll, we'll call it a night. Um, have fun out there. Definitely email me or Jared if you have questions or your regional coordinator. And um, yeah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.